All right, hello everyone. We're about to get into our second part of the lecture on the Hebrews, and we're going to lecture on the Hebrew culture. Hi. Hi. Oh, what are we doing, Eve? What are we lecturing on, the Hebrews? Yeah. Yeah, can you say Hebrews? Hebrews. Hebrews. What's this, apple? The poor? A dome. A dome, that's right. It's a red apple. Very good. What's that one? What's that's, that apple? That's a red apple. What's that one? That's honey. Vash. Say honey. Say honey. What's that? Okay, so there you go, a little cameo from the baby. And so, yeah, we're going to go ahead and lecture on the Hebrews today of my little daughter. Uh, and we're going to kind of cover the cultural history of the Hebrews today. This image that you see here uh, is actually from one of the very more well-known Jewish holidays, which will be part of our discussion a little bit later. So, what are we covering? What do we need to know, um, you know, in terms of understanding the Hebrew? We talked about the political history. We talked about, you know, Saul, David, Solomon. We talked about what happened to the land, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and all of that. We're, we're going to come back to more political history, but I want to talk about, again, the cultural history and the cultural kind of contributions as well of the Hebrew people that dated back thousands of years ago and the culture is still around today, which in itself is pretty astonishing. So let's start with this. Um, and these are some information in terms of how do we know, right? What are our sources? How do we know about the cultural history of the Hebrews? And people say, well, the Old Testament. And of course, that's true, the Bible. Now, when you talk about the Old Testament, you talk about the Bible, there's actually three parts to it. So you definitely want to know this. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The two New Testaments for Christianity, the Old Testament is for Judaism. Within the Old Testament, there are different parts. There's the Torah, that's probably the most famous, and the Torah that includes the stories of Genesis and Exodus that you're probably most familiar with. There's something called Nevi'im, and these are all Hebrew words, of course, and Nevi'im, that's about the Jewish figures. That's where we learn about Saul and David and the judges, and that's where we get those information from. And the Ketuvim, the Ketuvim is the writings, and that's where we get a lot of the proverbs and stories that we associate with Jewish culture. Uh, so that's where we get most of our information from. And a lot of people, of course, have heard the Torah, they've heard of Genesis, they've heard of Exodus. Not as many people have heard of the Talmud. And the Talmud is actually very significant. The Talmud is where you also get a lot of the cultural teachings of the Hebrews. The Talmud is a document written over really a massive amount of time period. It's written anywhere from about 1100 BC to roughly 200 AD, but most of it was written between 70 AD and 200 AD. And when you look at the Talmud, it also provides a lot of ideas, moral sayings that are associated with the Jewish culture. Uh, let me give you a few examples. I'm just going to read to you a few quotes from the Talmud to give you an idea of what the Talmud is about and how it ties in with Jewish cultures and values. All right, so for example, one of the saying it says in the Talmud, when good people die, they are not really dead for their example lives on. Another one is, love your wife as much as yourself, but honor her more than yourself. Another one, you don't need to memorize these, it's just to give you a sense of it. He who seeks a friend without faults will remain friendless. Another one is, he who saves a life saves the world entire. If any of you ever watched Schindler's List, it's a very famous quote in Schindler's List. He who saves a life saves the world entire. And another interesting one is this one, he who is kind to the cruel is cruel to the kind. And, you know, there are others, it's about work, like no labor, however humble, is dishonoring, right? So encouraging people, doesn't matter what work you do, if you work, there's no dishonor in any job you have. And so these are kind of the ideas in the Talmud, and there are many others as well. Uh, and you could spend a lifetime studying any one of these documents. But this is where we get the information from. So as I talk about the cultural history, the characteristics of the, the Jewish people, this is where the information primarily comes from. And there are a lot of characteristics of the Jewish people. Uh, again, you could spend a lifetime talking about them. I'm going to run through, I don't know exactly how many examples and how many characteristics, 
but several, he's six, seven, eight, nine, uh, you know, and I'll just kind of point each one out as we go through it. As we look at the slides, I'll give you some terms to know and some of the key characteristics. So that's what you're jotting notes down in this lecture. You're basically getting down what are the characteristics of Judaism as part of their culture. So I hope all that's clear. All right, let's go on and talk about the basics, right? On the most basic level, Judaism is a monotheistic religion, right? Monotheism. It is the first permanent monotheistic religion. Um, within the Jewish faith, you know, you talk about a God, God. In Hebrew, there's actually a few different words you sometimes use to talk about God. And so I put three terms there, Elohim, Adonai, and Yahweh. And all three of these are ways you might read about God, to the, how God is called in various biblical writings. Um, so it depends what source you're reading, depends on translations, it depends on a lot of things, but th this is monotheism, one God, as opposed to polytheism, like we saw in Mesopotamia, the early civilizations there, which are polytheistic, right, many gods. Now, another really important characteristic of the Jewish faith is the concept of a Messiah and how this ties in with Christ and Christianity. So we definitely want to understand this. So this would be a second point. What is a Messiah? Well, the idea of a Messiah is that of a savior, somebody who comes in and brings salvation to the people. Uh, and there's an idea within Judaism that a Messiah is going to come and bring that. Christ was seen by some Jewish people as a Messiah. This is how you get Christianity. Basically, the difference between Judaism and Christianity is that the Jewish people who believed Christ was the Messiah, the Savior, became Christians. Remember, Christ himself was Jewish. I'm assuming most people know that, right? Christ was Jewish. And so the Jewish people believed Christ was the Messiah became Christians. The Jewish people who said, no, Christ doesn't meet the characteristics of the Messiah remained Jews. Uh, now, what are these characteristics? Well, one of the characteristics it said that, and this is why some Jewish people said, no, Christ, not the Messiah, uh, th is that the Messiah was supposed to be a descendant of David, which is hard to trace, but that's one of the characteristics. Another characteristic was that the Messiah was supposed to bring all the Jewish people back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, you know, bring peace to the Jewish people. And that's another characteristic that the Messiah is supposed to achieve. Um, also that the Messiah was supposed to be a great scholar, right? And so these are some of the handful of characteristics that Jewish people at the time said, no, Christ is not the Messiah. And by the way, Christ is not the only person who claimed to be a Messiah for the Jewish faith. He is the one that, of course, got the most traction. And this is, of course, where you get Christianity. So one of the most significant you know, contributions of the Jewish faith is you do get Christianity out of it. While Judaism is very small, Christianity is massive. Um, and also, of course, the Islamic faith. When we talk about Islam in this class, you know, we will see that the Islamic faith also has some of its roots from Judaism. So while Judaism is very small, the Christian faith has about two billion people. The Muslim faith has about one and a half billion people when you take all the denominations together. And now you're looking at about a third of the global population that's influenced by this monotheistic religion dating back to, again, you know, thousands of years ago. So these are a couple basic characteristics right off about Jewish culture and Jewish uh, faith that you'd want to know. So monotheism and the concept of the Messiah, the connections with Christ, I think that's an interesting thing to note as well. All right, so I hope all that's clear. Another important characteristic of the Jewish traditions and customs, very famous, the Ten Commandments. Now, everyone's heard the Ten Commandments, and I put a Hebrew version of it just for fun. Um, obviously, I know you can't read all this, uh, but the Ten Commandments are important because they're part of Jewish teachings, part of Jewish culture, but they go beyond that. And the reason the Ten Commandments are so important, and this is another interesting point about contributions of the Jewish people to our world today, so many of our legal systems today are actually based on what is called Judeo-Christian value systems. 
And when you look at the Ten Commandments, they have tremendous influence in our, our own history and the United States history and our laws, um, in our rules. You know, our founding fathers were very religious people. They studied the Old Testament. They read the Bible. Uh, you know, there was discussion of even making the seal of the United States an image of Moses crossing the Red Sea. Uh, they they knew this stuff. They were motivated by it. I mean, if you think of the you know the, the 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 rights that we get in our society, where do they come from? They they are given to us from God, right? You don't put that in a document uh, if you're not a religious person. So obviously, our founding fathers were very religious individuals. So there are the Ten Commandments. They're important. One of them that I always like to talk about, at least I'll talk about a couple of them, is the one that a lot of people say, it says, thou shall not kill. And actually, that's not one of the Ten Commandments. There's no Ten Commandments that says, thou shall not kill. There's one that says, thou shall not murder which is a big difference because we're allowed to murder, we're allowed to kill in the United States. We're not allowed to murder. Um, and so that's something that's interesting. When you see translations, a lot of the English translations are actually not right. You know, when they say thou shall not kill, that's not a proper translation. In the Hebrew, it says lo lechzoach, don't murder, right? You don't need to, to know the Hebrew of it, of course, but definitely says no murder. Another interesting one, it says, do not take God's name in vain. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean don't say God damn it. That's not what it means. When it says do not take God's name in vain, what that commandment is getting at is don't do evil in the name of God. So if somebody says I'm committing an act of evil, murder, killing in the name, murder, kill uh, in the name of God, you're actually violating one of the Ten Commandments. So, you know, this in itself could be a whole topic of study. And all I'm doing now is just really grazing the surface on all these things. So as we talk about each of these points, you could take, you know, and, and study a lot more history of Jewish culture and learn a lot more detail about it. But at least I'm giving you some of the highlights. So the Ten Commandments, that would be another example of the characteristics of the Jewish people. All right, this one's kind of fun. A kosher eating. So this is another characteristic of Jewish culture that you would want to know. And what is kosher? Obviously, you know the term kosher. Most people have heard it. Uh, this little K symbol you may have seen sometimes. Uh, on some food that designates the food is kosher. And there's some basic characteristic of kosher eating. No pork is the big one, of course. Uh, no dairy and meat together. That's one that a lot of people aren't as familiar with. That if you are a practicing Jewish person, you're not supposed to eat meat and dairy products together at the same time. Um, another one is you can eat fish, but no shell, shell, shellfish, uh, so, or bottom dwellers, as they're often called. And what's really interesting about these few examples of kosher law, kosher eating, even how the animal is killed has to be done a certain way. There are a lot of people who aren't Jewish who will go to a Jewish baker, or I'm sorry, a Jewish um, um, butcher. And they will go to a Jewish butcher because they know that the meat is better, that it's healthier. And that's interesting about kosher eating, that a lot of people kind of study it and go, wow, it's healthy. You know, pork is bad for you. Shellfish is bad for you. Salmon is good for you. Uh, so there, there was this amazing understanding of this, of, of, of what is just healthier eating. So I think that's kind of an interesting point. Now, you know, I put here, how observant are Jews to these laws? Do, do all Jewish people eat kosher? Well, this gets to our next topic that I like to talk about, because within the Jewish faith, within any monotheistic religion, they're not monolithic. There are different interpretations and denominations of any faith. It's true of Christianity. It's true of Islam as well, right? Not all Christians are, follow the same beliefs, right? You have Protestants, you have Catholics, and in Islamic faith, you have Sunnis and Shiites. We'll talk about that later. And in Judaism, you also have different interpretations that lead to different ways of approaching things like eating kosher and other cultural aspects of, of the Jewish society. So you definitely want to know this next part. And these are the different interpretations of Judaism, and I'll explain these two pictures. Um, so these three, four terms actually want to know. The first three terms are the traditional ones that you will read about, that when you talk about Judaism, there are Orthodox, Conservative, and Reformed Jews. What are secular Jews? I'll explain that. That's kind of one of my own little thing that I throw in there that you probably won't read in many books, but I think it's really important to understand. So within the Jewish culture, you have Orthodox Jews. 
The Orthodox Jews are the ones that take the Old Testament and the kosher eating and all the rules very strict. All right. And so here on the left over here on this side, uh, you have an image of an Orthodox Jewish family. Now, how do you know it's an Orthodox Jewish family? Well, you know, you yeah, see how they're dressed, the man has a beard, the women tend to be covered up, and you also see lots of children. One, two, three, four, five, probably another one on the way. Um, and so Orthodox Jews tend to, to, to be very strict. If you walk into an Orthodox Jew's home, for example, you will see uh, uh, separate utensils for dairy products and meat products, separate refrigerators for dairy and meat. So they're very, very strict. The Orthodox Jews are the ones that always observe the Sabbath, the, the, the um, Shabbat, or the, the Friday night, Saturday day, where you're not supposed to work, you're not supposed to even light a candle or a, a anything, and they're very, very strict. So that's the Orthodox. The conservative Jews, they're kind of in the middle. They, they, they believe in the holidays. They practice all the holidays. They tend to eat kosher, uh, but they're not going to be dressed in the same way you see the Orthodox Jews. They're not going to, you know, live a very strict interpretation of everything. They're probably not going to go to temple every single Saturday, maybe just on the highest holy days. And so that would be conservative Jews. Reform Jews are basically Jews that really just interpret the Bible however way they please. And so for Reformed Jews, for example, you could have female rabbis, right? It's just like, why not? Uh, Reformed Jews, you know, are it's like you're Jewish, but the laws are almost like to individual interpretations almost. Um, and so they, they're very lax with the way things done. And, you know, I think the big thing is having Jewish female rabbis, something you wouldn't see in an Orthodox Jewish community. And then you have secular Jews. And what are secular Jews? Well, this is the image on the right. Both of these images here are from Israel. Uh, Orthodox Jews, Jerusalem, and here are secular Jews in Tel Aviv. And, you know, these are Jewish people. And they're out partying, having a good old time. And what does secular Jewish mean? Well, you're born into a Jewish family. Now, technically, the way it's historically worked, if your mom is Jewish, you're Jewish, although there are some in the Jewish community who say, no, if your father is Jewish, you could be Jewish as well, because we have, you know, paternal t paternity tests today, so you could show that. Um, and so you're born into a Jewish family, right? It, it's a religion. Now, you can convert to Judaism. Anyone can convert to Judaism if they want. You have to go through schooling and learning and education, and you can convert. Uh, but, you know, anybody, so if you're born Jewish, you're born Jewish, but what if you're born Jewish and you're just not practicing? You just, you're, you're Jewish, but you're born into the family, you don't practice it. Well, you're a kind of a secular Jew at that point. You know, you're Jewish by birth, but not by anything else. And you have a lot of that. You have some of that in Israel. You have a lot of that in the United States. And so that's kind of an interesting point as well. You, have, you do have secular Jews. Now, in Israel, it's pretty fascinating because these cultures, you have all of these. You have Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, Secular Jews, and they all live in Israel at the same time. And it is interesting how they have to balance each other off this way. Because, you know, the Orthodox Jews, they want, you know, no buses on Saturday. And the secular Jews are like, we want to go to the beach and party on Saturday. And so they, they make these different concessions and they work it through and they, they kind of manage to do this without. Sometimes there's animosity, but never any violence or, or physical attacks against one another uh, in this sense. And so you'll have like pockets of really orthodox Jews in some communities and other pockets of more secular Jews. Um, Israel today is interesting because Israel today is a Jewish state, but it's also a, a kind of secular Jewish state. You know, uh, homosexuality, for example, is, is very acceptable in the state of Israel, even though it's a religious Jewish state, technically. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of um, individuals from uh, outside of Israel in the Arab world that will, you know, escape, try to get to Israel because they're homosexuals because they know in Israel that nothing will happen to them. They'll be protected and, and no, no issues. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting point as well. So anyways, that's what we mean by the different interpretations. You have Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Secular Jews. You definitely want to know everything I just kind of said on all that. All right, a few other cultural elements of the Jewish people. So we're just going to hit a few real quickly here. Salvation. 
there is a concept of salvation, uh, Gan Ha Eden, which is kind of um, heaven, I guess you could say, is an example of a salvation concept in Judaism. Another point in the characteristic of Judaism is autopsy and organ donation. They're actually forbidden in Judaism. And the reason they're forbidden is this their idea that when the Messiah comes, you're, you're, everyone's going to kind of ascend together and you want to be full, you want to be whole. And people say, so no organ donations? What if someone is dying and, and you're not supposed to give an organ if you can to save a life and all of that? Well, there's another idea in Judaism. This is a good one to know. Pikuach nefesh, right? I know that sometimes it's, these are all words in Hebrew, but there's no real good translations for them. What does that word pikuach nefesh mean? It basically means if you can save a life, that trumps other laws in Judaism. So it's a Jewish idea that, you know, for example, you're not supposed to drive on Saturday. Well, what if someone's having a heart attack? Do you not drive them to the hospital? Of course you do, because you're trying to save their life. That's the concept of pikuach nefesh. So that's an interesting one. Uh, so just know that one. Uh, no tattoos. Uh, this is an important one for Jewish culture, that you're not supposed to have tattoos. Uh, and again, you know, I've tried to read why that is. It just kind of goes back to old, a whole bunch of biblical writings about not having your body marked, uh, where, of course, this becomes real important is the Holocaust. Because during the Holocaust, I'm sure many of you are aware, the Nazis tattooed numbers on Jewish people. So it was just obviously beyond the, the evil of rounding people up to murder them. It was this extra humiliation involved with it um, and that's why today even very very few Jewish people you know have tattoos uh, it's just something that is it's almost like ta it's taboo in, in many ways I think in the Jewish culture and then finally last one circumcision this is for boys obviously um, you know all male babies are circumcised it is one of the core cultural elements of being Jewish all male babies are circumcised Okay, so there's that. All right, the next thing I want to talk about are the holidays. And so this, this is kind of interesting as well. All this stuff I think is, is fun to talk about. And there are a lot of Jewish holidays. I'm going to run through just a handful of them. Obviously, all of these you want to know. Everyone I give you, all these kind of key terms there. And these are the key words. Sometimes I don't write the word key words, uh, but anything that you see on these images that's written are obviously the key words or the key terms you need to know. So let's start with the first one called Yom Kippur. Maybe you've heard some of these, maybe you haven't, but I want you to know all of them. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. Uh, this happens every year. Um, it, it circulates what time of the year because the Jewish calendar is the holidays don't fall exactly. So uh, usually it's sometime in September, October, Yom Kippur. And that's the Day of Atonement. This is when Jewish people fast. Uh, for 24 hours, no food, no water, uh, and that's the day you're supposed to reflect in the past year, how to better yourself as a person, you know, and you spend the whole day praying. In Israel, if you go to Israel, everything is shut down for the year. This is the probably the most significant holiday of Judaism. This is the one that pretty much everyone observes in Jewish culture, uh, Orthodox, conservative, Reformed Jews even. Uh, this is probably the, the highest holy day, Yom Kippur. So that's the Day of Atonement um, and when you fast for an entire day. Another one is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, in the image in the beginning, I showed you an image of apples and honey. Well, Rosh Hashanah literally translates, the word Rosh is head. Ha is the, Shana is year, head of the year. This is New Year's. And so in Jewish culture, you have a New Year's holiday. And that's, you know, it's kind of a nice one. You have a lot of white apple and honey. You don't do a big prayers, but you have a few small prayers. You have a nice dinner. Uh, you, you, you make a few blessings to sweet things. So apple and honey, sweet. Uh, honey cake is very common in Rosh Hashanah. And so it's about just wishing a sweet new year. Probably one of the more famous and interesting ones is Pesach, or as we call it, Passover. And I have an image for you here of a Seder plate, right? So here's the term Seder, and what is the Pesach and the Seder and all that? Well, Pesach, this is, of course, the story of the Exodus. And this is the one, if you've never been to a Passover Seder, try to find a Jewish friend and go. 
Uh, it's one of those things, if you go every year, oh my goodness, Jewish people don't even like doing this every year because it's long. Rosh Hashanah is just a few short prayers and you have a nice meal. Passover, depending on who you do it with, it is like an hour and a half of just prayers and story. You're telling a story. You're telling the entire story of the Exodus. Um, and you make these prayers to some food items and you tell the story of, you know, the Jews leaving Egypt and all of that. Um, and then eat matzah for a week. Why matzah? Matzah is, of course, that bread that doesn't rise because the story is that the Jewish people had to get out of uh, Egypt real quick and they didn't have time for the bread to rise. So, so they eat unleavened bread. Um, and, you know, this is important, but because this is a story, the Exodus, you know, thousands of years ago, right? We don't know exactly. There is actually evidence of an Exodus, but when it happened is not exact. But the fact that a story that's 3,000 years old, that is still told year after year, generation after generation, this is how a culture survives. I mean, think of U.S. history. And one of the biggest problems we have in U.S. history is how little honor and respect we give to our culture and our holidays. Fourth of July. What do we do on Fourth of July? People have barbecues and fireworks. What should we do on Fourth of July? You should read the Declaration of Independence. You should study that document. You should understand what our nation is about because then it gives it meaning. And if families did that generation to generation, you would have an American identity. And one of the biggest problems in our society is most people don't even know what it means to be an American. And, and that's unfortunate because it is important to have something to bond us as a civilization. Otherwise, you, you kind of fragment and you, you polarize and you, you, know, you have problems. And so it, it's important to have traditions and, and customs and tell the story year after year. It's what's helped the Jewish people uh, survive for centuries, millenniums. So Passover, that's an important. Another holiday, another somber holiday is Tisha B'Av. And so you have this one written here. What is Tisha B'Av in 70 AD? Tisha is the Hebrew word for ninth, right? The number ninth. Av is the month. There's a month in the Jewish calendar called Av. So it's the ninth of Av. The holiday is AV. So it's called Tisha B'Av. What is important about that? Well, that's when the second temple of the Jewish people was destroyed. So this is another kind of somber holiday, a little bit like Yom Kippur. Not all Jewish people fast, but some Jewish people fast during that holiday. And we'll talk about this again later on when we talk about how that second temple is destroyed. It'll be destroyed when the Romans enter this land of Judea, and we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a lecture. So those are the big holidays. And then you go, well, there's another one. What about Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah is a very famous holiday in the United States, but in reality, in Israel, it's not that big of a holiday. Um, it, it, the reason Hanukkah is so well known in the United States is because it often falls around Christmas time. And because it often falls around Christmas time, if you're Jewish living in the United States and all your children's friends are getting presents and gifts and this and that, you don't want to feel them left out. And so Jewish people really make a big deal about Hanukkah, probably more in the United States than they do in Israel. The basic story of the Jewish people is when uh, the, in, the, in the Greek period, when the Greeks were trying to suppress the Jewish culture, the group of people known as the Maccabees fought against the Greeks to preserve their culture and their heritage. There's, of course, the very famous story that they, they, they had enough oil for one night, but it lasted eight nights. And that's why the Hanukkah celebration is eight nights of lighting candles on the menorah. Um, it's, it's an important holiday. It's not as important as the other ones. I always put it in there as something, I guess, worth noting. Uh, but these are the key holidays of the Jewish culture. There are many, many others. But again, since this is just a survey course of Middle Eastern history and not a whole entire course on Jewish history, I'm just kind of giving you the, the bare bones of all this stuff. All right, so those are the holidays. So that's pretty much the big stuff I want you to know. So those, each of these things that I've been talking about, the holidays, the monotheism, the Ten Commandments, the issues that I gave you in all these other slides, those are all individual cultural traits of the Jewish people that I definitely want you to know about. All right, and so here we're back to our map, and this is kind of where we are. So we've now talked about the Jewish people who've kind of controlled this area here. Not quite that big, right? Just the area in green here. 
Um, and they, they're living in this area from about 1100 BC onward until, you know, we talked about the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And that's what we need to do next. So our next lecture is what happens as the Jewish people are living in this area. What's the role of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians? And so those are the other post-Dark Age cultures. So we're not uh, civilizations. So we're not done with the Jewish culture. We're still going to talk a little bit more about it. But we're going to talk about it as we look at these other civilizations. And so we'll talk about the Assyrians next. We'll talk about the Babylonians. We'll talk about the Persians. We'll talk a little bit about what happens even when the Roman world moves into Judea. Uh, so we'll discuss that. But that's all going to come in subsequent lectures that we're going to move on to. All right, so I hope all that's clear. So you should have a lot of information now on the Hebrews. You should know, again, the political history from part one and the cultural history from part two. And then the third point that I wanted you to know is the impacts other civilizations have on the Jewish people. And that's going to come in other lectures. All right, I hope you found all that interesting. Um, again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.